Did you know that about 90% of a cell's RNA is actually ribosomal RNA? And well, if you want to look at the other RNAs, like messenger RNAs, that rRNA can get in the way. And so we have methods that we can use to either get rid of that rRNA, so rRNA depletion, or we can just like pull out the stuff that we care about and just sequence that, so such as like mRNA enrichment. Let me explain. When it comes to making proteins, messenger RNA or mRNA tends to get the most attention. But really it's the ribosomal RNA that's doing the bulk of the work. The messenger RNA carries the instructions, but the ribosomal RNA makes up the, in addition to some ribosomal proteins, makes up these big complexes called ribosomes that actually move along that messenger RNA and use its instructions to piece together a protein. Your cells need to make a lot of different proteins and ribosomes are really big. So you have a lot of these really big ribosomes that are made up largely of RNA. What does this work out to? It works out to being about 80 to 90% of your cellular RNA is actually ribosomal RNA or rRNA, which is great if you wanna make proteins, but not so great if you want to look and see what those messenger RNA copies are which we often want to do in order to say, look at gene expression. So look at what, what protein cells are making when. Basically, the, they have to make a messenger RNA copy of the genetic instructions, the gene, before they can make that protein. And the more of these copies that they make, the more of the protein that they can make. And so by measuring how many copies there are, we can get information about what, what they're making when and how much and that sort of thing. And so we can use techniques like um, mRNA se sequencing or just total RNA sequencing as well to get information about what mRNAs are present in a cell at what time and under what conditions. And so I go over more about this in other posts, but basically we can do things like use Illumina sequencing, which breaks up all of that um, RNA into smaller pieces, converts them into DNA and adds adapters and stuff so that you can sequence them and then you can um, piece together all these different sequences computationally to figure out what's in the mixture. But what's in your mixture, if your mixture is starting off with 90% being rRNA, well, now your mixture is going to be largely rRNA. And the things can be even worse if you're doing something like ribosome profiling, also known as footprinting or riboseq, where here you're isolating ribosome-bound fragments. So basically you're taking the cells, you're pausing the ribosomes where they are along the messenger RNAs. You're using nuclease to digest the RNA around them. The, the RNA that the ribosome is sitting on is gonna be protected from the nuclease. And so now when you um, digest everything else away and then you put adapters on and sequence those pieces that the ribosome was sitting on, you can get information about what was being made when. And so this is a cool technique. Um, but here you're actually enriching for ribosomes and most of the RNA you get is gonna be those ribosomes. And then this little fragments that they're sitting on is what you actually care about. So whether you're doing ribosome profiling or when you're, whether you're doing mRNA sequencing or total RNA sequencing, you're gonna to have to worry about having a lot of that ribosomal RNA. And so how do we get rid of it? There are a few different strategies. A lot of them are gonna involve using DNA sequences. So like oligos, these short DNA sequences that complement regions that are RNA. So by complement, I just mean that they can form like um, specific base pairing interactions with them, like the interactions between the strands of DNA. There are different purposes for this. One is to, um, to block reverse transcription of it. So during the process of making that library, we're gonna convert the RNA to DNA. And then it's that DNA that's going to be sequenced. Unless we're talking about like direct RNA sequencing, which we're not talking about here, I'm just talking about like your standard, your standard sequencing protocol. You're going to basically make cDNA, you're gonna make complementary DNA of that RNA and that DNA. Not only is it gonna be more stable, but it can also, it's also compatible with being, um, being copied using DNA polymerases in these, in these experiments and in, in these protocols and sequencers. Now, the reverse transcription, this converting the mRNA to a DNA copy is done by a molecule called reverse transcriptase. And in order for reverse transcriptase to do its job, it needs to have access to the RNA. And so if you block the RNA using one of those 
um, DNA probes, well, now that can't be reverse transcribed. And so you're not going to make cDNA of those pieces, but you will make cDNA of all the other pieces. And so those will get sequenced, but the ones that had those probes bound won't. And so by knowing the sequences of these rRNA, they can, um, you can design these, these like libraries of these different probes that are going to bind specifically to that rRNA now. So those probes could be used to block the reverse transcriptase. Other times they're used to make it susceptible to an RNA or DNA hybrid chewer. Um, so RNA's H is this enzyme or this reaction helper or speeder upper. Basically what it does is it looks and it finds RNA DNA duplexes, these like hybrid. And what it's going to do is it's going to um, selectively cut the RNA in that case. And so this is going to allow these probes to get your RNA, our RNA digested um, and degraded and so that it won't be used and won't be sequenced. So this is one strategy. And a third strategy is to basically have those probes be attached to a handle like biotin. We can then get these to stick to a streptogavidin labeled beads. Um, and this way, the probe is gonna bind to the RNA and then the, the probe is also going to bind to these beads and we can use this technique called subtractive hybridization. Hybridization is basically when two things are binding together. These are like forming these hybrids between this DNA, um, this probe, this labeled probe and your rRNA. And then you're subtracting it from your mixture by using these magnetic beads as I'll get into in a second. So basically you take rRNA or you take RNA or DNA. Um, sometimes this is done before you make cDNA, sometimes it's done after. You add a mix of biotinylated DNA oligos. So remember, oligos is just like a short sequence, um, and these are complementary to regions of rRNA. You can either design your own custom libraries or buy like a kit. Now, these are going to bind to the rRNA, and they're also going to have that biotin label. And biotin is going to stick very, 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 very tightly to a partner called streptavidin. And we can have these magnetic beads that are have streptavidin attached to them. When we have something like permanently attached like this, we call it conjugated, this like linkage. And this is going to allow us to capture the biotinylated DNA and the rRNA it's bound to. And then we can kind of remove those beads and get free rRNA. What's cool is that these beads are usually magnetic or paramagnetic. What this means is that normally they'll hang out normally, um, but when you put a magnet near them, they're going to go and move towards that magnet. So this is going to allow us to now take our mixture of RNA and or DNA and these probes. We get this like slurry, we stick it on this magnet, and now all the beads are going to be drawn towards the magnet. You can see that the beads are getting pulled towards the magnet. What we do is we wait until all of the beads are there and the liquid is clear. Um, so typically what we do is we start by taking the beads and we equilibrate them with the buffer we want them to be in. Um, so we get the beads all used to the buffer and then we add our sample. And then once we add our sample, um, we let them mix for like 15 minutes or so on a shaker. And then we put them on the platform. Now all the rRNA is getting pulled with the beads towards the magnet. We have this clear solution containing our rRNA depleted um, sequences. And then we can just pull that out and voila, we have our RNA, we have our RNA depleted solution that we can then use to go on with preparation of our library. So some kits that use this biotinylated pro method are like Illumina's Ribo Zero, um, Kiagen's Gene Read RNA Depletion Kit, Lexigen Ribocop. There are also a variety um, of kind of like custom strategies. If you're using something from another species, say they might not have a kit available. And so you can make your own um, specific ones based on the rRNA sequences from that species. Other kits um, use that rRNA, that RNA's H strategy I talked about, where basically you, you make those hybrids of DNA and RNA, and then you use RNA's H, which is going to selectively cut the RNA in an RNA-DNA hybrid. Some of these kits include NEB Next rRNA depletion um, kits, Kappa Ribo-Race and Takara Clontex Ribogene, Ribogon. These are also often going to use magnetic beads, but here the beads are basically just used as a purification strategy. These are different kinds of beads. They're called SPRI beads, um, or solid phase reversible immobilization. 
And here, what you're doing is instead of like permanently binding your stuff to those beads through the probes, you're going to basically just get them to temporarily bind by precipitating them using um, high concentrations of PEG and NACL. And so I have more on this in another post, but basically you make the conditions so that the RNA or DNA will, um, will precipitate, will bind to these beads. Then you can um, collect the beads, wash everything else off and change the conditions so that your DNA or RNA will elute or come off. Um, and so um, different strategy, different type of beads, but they're also this paramagnetic thing so that you can easily separate things. And you can um, do cool things like size select, depending on how much of the precipitants you add and things like this and much more of that in my post on it. Um, so those were a couple of the main methods. In addition to the depletion methods, there are also enrichment methods which say, okay, instead of getting rid of the RNA, let's just try to pull out the messenger RNA or some other RNA if you have some specific thing that you're looking for. Now, often what we're looking for is that messenger RNA because that's gonna tell us about the expression, how many copies are being made. Now, more and more people are using like the, just the depletion method because some, there can be some bias if you're only choosing things with these poly um, T tails, you might only get the ends of the sequences and things like this. But basically the strategy works by taking advantage of the fact that messenger RNAs get this polyadenosine tail, the string of A's on their end. And so what you can do is you can use beads that are attached to a poly T um, and basically what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to separate out those messenger RNAs and thereby enrich for them. Now, some this, as I said, a lot of people use total RNA-seq instead of this because, well, if you're looking for things other than messenger RNA, those won't have the poly A. Even if something has the poly A, it's going to be at the very end. And so if you're interested in something going on, say, further in, upstream of that gene, you won't get that. And so instead, what happens is people often enrich for, instead of enriching, they deplete the RNA. And again, a couple of the main strategies um, for doing this are making it susceptible to the RNA's H cleavage or depleting it with these biotelinated probes or blocking the reverse transcription. And often we're using magnetic beads when we're doing these either to remove the probe and the labeled stuff or to basically just do, do some sort of purification step. And the magnetic beads are fun, um, so that could be a fun part of this protocol, even if it's not too fun otherwise. Um, but hope that helps you understand our RNA depletion. Remember that this is going to be very, very important to either this and or enrichment, because the vast, vast majority of your cellular RNA is actually going to be ribosomal RNA. So hope this helps.